There were 12 of us to begin with, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. Chapter 9, Night Crawler, January 2nd, 1990. A figure the very same figure that had stalked the halls of Miller's Manor several nights before, emerged from the quiet of the library a little after three in the morning. The scattering of contestants throughout the previous day had made it possible for the killer to operate from the shadows once more, allowing them to move undetected between rooms and corridors via hidden panels and passageways known only to a few. White Admiral was out cold in the games room. This the killer had witnessed firsthand and made for an easy target. But it wasn't the inebriated man's turn. No, the assassin had a different target in mind. The mutilation of False Widow's body had been a clue as to the host's next target. The meat of the clue lay beneath the plastic bag over False Widow's head. If the contestants had ventured to remove that death shroud, they would have discovered the victim's eyes and ears missing, an undertaking intended to implicate Nightcrawler, the worm. The very excellent job the killer had done of severing False Widow's torso at the waist was merely the icing on the cake, suggestive of the work of a spade in the garden. The host was reveling in their work, taking a great deal of pleasure from it. Sure, the act of killing False Widow was satisfying, but the mutilation of her lukewarm body afterwards was exhilarating. The bit with the garden shears had been absolutely sensational and it was with a tremendous sense of excitement and vigour that the murderer had continued along the empty corridor, crossed the grand hall, and tiptoed into the reception hall, where Nightcrawler, the tall, dark-haired man, lay flat on the floor besides the flickering fire, a pillow from one of the room's many sofas beneath his head. In his hand, he still clutched a half-glass of brandy, some of which had spilled onto the floor. The killer knew he would be there, for the figure had watched him drift off into slumber several hours earlier. He lay precisely where the killer's dragon had been crafted. How symbolic it would have been to have done away with Scarlet Darter in that very spot. The spit and crackle of the fire had disguised the killer's soft tread, as slowly the figure crept in the direction of the sleeper. The storm without was in full force, the whistling of the wind a living thing beyond the window panes. But Nightcrawler heard neither, heard nothing whatsoever. The host crouched beside him, withdrawing a syringe and a hypodermic needle. The murderer watched over the unwitting victim, studied the look of peace and tranquility upon his sleeping face, listened to the calming sound of his uninterrupted breathing, the rhythmical rising and falling of the chest. And it was with the softest of voices that the host began to hum that eerie tune again. Out it rose, that appalling, dissonant melody, horribly harmonized with the storm without. And then, slowly, with great care and attention, the killer inserted the hypodermic needle into a bulging vein, clearly visible on the side of Nightcrawler's unprotected neck. He grunted briefly, but, suitably sedated by the brandy, the breaking of the skin elicited no further sounds. Administering the ominous contents of the syringe, the host grinned, in the moments that followed, the killer retreated, backing up against the north wall, sliding effortlessly between two towering cabinets. From the gloom, the host had watched as Nightcrawler began to yield to the dreadful concoction of chemicals coursing through his veins. He convulsed, and then, involuntarily in his sleep, he started to scratch about his neck, right where the injection had been administered. The glass in his hand was tossed aside— and then he was groaning, in and out of consciousness, the itching sensation evidently spreading throughout his entire being. He shot up with a jolt, and there, by the fire, he tore at his shirt, pulling it away from his body, which, as evidenced by the way in which he manically clawed at the skin about his chest and belly, was more than mildly irritated. He stumbled to his feet, danced a death jig, 
and a look of horror filled the tall man's face, as right before the eyes of the killer, Nightcrawler's arms and face began to swell. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. He was lost in a living nightmare, at a total loss as to where to go, what to do, and what to think. Up and down the length of the reception hall he slipped and scuttled, his swollen feet refusing him the liberty to walk. His head resembled a pumpkin, a bloated purple pumpkin, fit to burst. On hands and knees, the once towering individual managed to crawl out into the grand hall, made it ten feet or so to the bottom of the stairs, and collapsed onto his back, no longer capable of progress. And there, coughing and splattering, the veins in his face lit up like the lights on the Christmas tree beside him, Nightcrawler lay dying. And the last thing he had seen had been a familiar face, belonging to a figure that had crouched beside him and placed something on the floor. The discovery of Nightcrawler's body later that same morning was met with a confusing combination of both shock and resignation. But the clue, White Admiral deliberated, his head still pounding. What was the clue? Clue? Andrina all but shrieked. You are still thinking about clues? Andrina aside, the other contestants were all thinking about clues, knowing that in all probability their very survival depended on it. But Andrina, her face pale with fear, was no longer willing to play the game, no longer willing to associate with those among her she feared were potentially capable of committing the horrifying crime she'd witnessed during murder at Miller's Manor. The middle-aged lady took off in the direction of her quarters. The other contestants couldn't have known it then, but that would be the last time they ever saw the lady who had so warmed them with her glowing smile and radiant demeanour during the early days of the event. What? What the hell do we do now? White Admiral stammered, his eyes glued to the caricature of a man that lay at his feet. Blue Bottle attempted to vocalise a response, but nothing legible left his lips. Black Garden's face was something to behold. Deep lines had appeared on his forehead, surmounting a countenance utterly fixed in a ghastly grimace. "'We've got to get out of here,' he said simply, his appalling expression unchanging. "'But we can't get out of here,' White Admiral reminded him, gesturing towards the vast windows at the top of the grand staircase. "'Look at it out there, and it's got to be five below. Shouldn't we at least try?' asked New Forest. Try, White Admiral repeated cynically, and head in which direction, pray tell? New Forest hesitated. I have no idea, she admitted. A period of silence followed, in which each of the four participants considered the question of orientation. It doesn't matter. We should try anyway, Black Garden said. If it hasn't escaped your attention, we're dropping like flies here. Who's going to be next, and when? At the mention of flies, Blue Bottle found his voice at last. Flies, he muttered, drawing the attention of the others. We missed the clue with False Widow, whatever it was supposed to be. It's much too late to dwell on that. But shouldn't we be taking a closer look at Nightcrawler while we still can? Or oh, we could talk about the elephant in the room. This from White Admiral, who was eyeballing his fellow contestants with that suspicious gaze of his. And what's that? Black Garden asked. The killer, White Admiral answered. Which one of you is it? Another stony silence followed. It had crossed the minds of everybody present on more than one occasion. What makes you think it's one of us? New Forest asked. It has to be, doesn't it? White Admiral returned. And I'm including Andrina in this. We're the only ones left. Fair enough, blurted Blue Bottle. But what about the missing? Grey Dagger, Longhorn, Yellow Jacket, Scarlet Darter. How can you be sure that it isn't one of them that's responsible for what's happening here? I mean... It was you who kept going on about stooges. That was before people started dying, White Admiral yelled. Blue Bottle shook his head. Listen, he said, lowering his tone. Look around you. And he gestured towards Black Garden and New Forest, as well as himself. Do you really see a killer here? That goes for Andrina, too. The woman so frightened that she's gone and locked herself in her room. White Admiral backed down, hearing truth in Blue Bottle's words. For several moments, the four contestants just stood there, Black Garden and Blue Bottle eyeballing the corpse in their midst, 
New Forest and White Admiral gazing off into space. It was New Forest who broke the silence. The needle, she muttered. The injection. What might it represent? Oh, I don't know, mumbled Black Garden. A bee sting? A wasp sting? Highly unlikely, seeing as though Yellow Jacket is no longer among us. And a discussion followed, there by the bloated body of Nightcrawler, regarding the names of the remaining contestants, and what they might represent. It was concluded that White Admiral represented a butterfly, Blue Bottle, of course, a common fly, and Black Garden, according to New Forest, an ant. As for what the names New Forest and Andrina represented, none could say. New Forest suggested a trip to the library, in order to scour its vast contents for books on the subject of entomology and the like, but Blue Bottle vetoed the idea, bringing the group's attention to what he considered to be work of a more pressing nature. And so, as per Blue Bottle's prompting, the four contestants saw to it that False Widow's door remained closed, they couldn't bear the thought of moving what was left of her, and that the poor, swollen body of Nightcrawler was taken out into the snow, to be placed, approximately, alongside the body of Green Drake. The latter was an especially difficult task, as the snow, once more, had created new and formidable snowdrifts. The four of them struggled against the violent winds, and learned, in doing so, that an attempt to walk out into the storm in order to escape Miller's Manor would be all but impossible. Andrina remained in her quarters throughout the day, responding with firm refusals when attempts to rouse her were made at her bedroom door. The others, fearful but relatively self-assured, remained in each other's company well into the early hours of the morning, doing everything in their power to talk each other out of their respective suspicions. Alcohol was avoided, each of them spooked by Nightcrawler's fate following his overindulgence the previous evening. And White Admiral, surprisingly, was all too happy to give his customary boozing a miss, under the circumstances. But the question remained as to just who it was that was behind the atrocious things that were happening to them. So familiar were they becoming with each other, that they were unable to see anything but honesty in each other's eyes. Familiar, friendly honesty. It was much more conceivable that the person behind the killings was one of the missing, dagger, longhorn, jacket, or darter, particularly those among the first to disappear, the ones they hadn't got to know very well, the ones much more likely to be harbouring dark secrets and monstrous motivations. Now the task at hand was to look out for one another, to ensure that the mysterious agent wouldn't do away with anybody else. They thought long and hard about Nightcrawler's bloated corpse, each of them agreeing that a sting of some description was what the state of his poor body most likely signified. Was Yellow Jacket, the wasp, still at large? Was there a bee among their number? Or was it pointing at something else beyond their reckoning? If the clue did suggest Yellow Jacket, then was it, in fact, a clue as to the identity of the killer, as opposed to the identity of the next victim? With only suppositions to work with, it was impossible to form a reasonable plan of action. The game that was no longer a game was ambiguous, macabre, and deadly. It was with a great deal of trepidation and uncertainty that the guests retired that evening. Yet, somehow, Black Garden, Blue Bottle, New Forest, and White Admiral were fortunate enough to make it through the night, which, in light of what had been happening, was nothing short of miraculous. Andrina, however, who had locked herself away for the entirety of January 2nd, was nowhere to be found when her counterparts attempted to wake her on the morning of January 3rd. Thanks for listening today, ladies and gents. Be sure to join us again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the next part of There Were Twelve of Us to Begin With. And until then, 